Hey, looking to the east, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. We have Alan Miner. We have Steve Zercher. Wow, from Japan. Alan is in Tokyo, and Steve is in uh, uh, Kobe. Osaka. Osaka, Osaka today. today. Osaka today. Okay, okay. Um, <laughs> And we know them both. They've both been on the show before, uh, Steve, many times. But Alan, this will be several times already for you, two or three times anyway, three times, I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, we really appreciate that. So let's open with you, uh, Alan. Sure. Well, I, I'm going to start by saying it's a lot more fun to be on your show there in Honolulu than from my apartment in Tokyo. <laughs> <laughs> OK, all right. Well, how is Japan for you, Alan? I mean, you know, what, what is it like these days? You have COVID, now you have floods. But you had that inevitable creativity around the, the Japanese model. How is it all coming together? Um, well, it's been kind of interesting because, of course, uh, when they were still trying to find some way to make the Olympics happen, uh, Japan did not go into lockdown. You didn't see any flare-ups or any any particular uh, issues with it. I think uh, Japan, you know, has a history of treating influenza very seriously and colds very seriously and teach their children to wash their hands. I think the 20 second hand wash routine that we saw for the first time in television United States here, that's routinely taught to children in elementary schools in Japan that, that germs can cause sickness and spreading, and if you are sick, you could spread germs and cause people to be sick. And one of the most fundamental ethical values in Japan is to not be a nuisance to other people. And so if you're sick, you wear a mask or you stay at home. And, and in order to avoid getting sick, you wash your hands. So as, as the, the mood here shifted from, we believe the Olympics can still happen, should still happen. I think the early, the early thinking in Japan was much along the lines of Trump that, this, that it's, uh, it's more like SARS and MERS than something new and scary that we should panic about. But basically one, once the decision to make the Olympics was postponed, then the political games around Corona, which are part of the whole story, kicked in, and you had battles between the mayor of Ko the mayor of uh, Koike, the mayor of Tokyo, and Abe, the prime minister, over who cared more about the people living in Tokyo. And <laughs> so the lockdown, the lockdown came in, and people were told to stay at home. And being already being used to doing this for uh, any kind of communicable disease, the, the Japanese were immediately very cooperative about wearing masks. The government, the government actually mass manufactured a bunch, had ordered a bunch of masks from, yeah. Uh, Steve was putting his on, just in case. Smile, smile, Steve, smile. <laughs> so I, I think we're adequately social distant this morning, guys. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not worried about getting, I'm not worried about getting corona. Although you never know, it's uncertain. You may be passed through Zoom. Yeah, don't don't get too close to the screen, Alan. Yeah, <laughs> so, but, but I think uh, what I what I'm seeing in the United States is is a lot of ongoing debate about the necessity of lockdowns, the trade off, the economic trade offs we're making, uh, the the potential health and social negative impacts of the lockdown versus Corona, and there's very little of that debate happening in Japan. Mm. Um, so where, where are you on the continuum? You know, I've been uh, sitting here and, you know, in my studio room, so to speak, I have a television, yep. turn off the sound and I watch it and they got charts every minute and the yep. charts are all going up and the country is aflame today, aflame. Uh, yep. how, how are things doing in Japan? Um, the, they're reporting, you know, the cases that are identified in Tokyo, the deaths are rarely reported anymore in either country. Uh, because you, you, what, what you notice is that as the testing increases, the cases identified are going up at a much faster rate than the deaths, and there should be a direct correlation. And, and so I, I, myself, I myself, as you probably already detected, the, 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 you know, I, I, I am very much of the point of view that all of the lockdowns, shutdowns, the behaviors that are being asked are uh, essentially, uh, in the overall scheme of things, counterproductive. And what we, what we have going on right now is one issue politics. It's much easier to make a decision in business, in politics, in life, if you only focus on one question. And if the question is, would we be safer and less likely to get sick and less likely to make other people sick if we didn't ever interact with anybody? The, question, the answer is absolutely yes. If the only issue you care about is not making other people sick and not getting sick, you should stay at home for, forever and ever. You might catch the flu and plenty of people die from the flu. So I, I think um, 
what the world we're living in is one that's extremely oversimplified uh, and the trade-offs uh, are not worth it. And that, that actually we could probably come out of it quicker through the herd approach uh, than waiting for a vaccine. We're 20 years into having SARS, having dealt with SARS, and we still have a vaccine for SARS. And the idea that we'll, in, within 18 months, we'll have one, that it will be effective. Um, you know, I, I, um, I'm, I'm, I, as you can tell, I'm very much on the, I, I'm, I am absolutely not a fan of Donald Trump, but I think the advice he was getting on this early on uh, was actually much more correct than what most of the governors have done in the States and what most of the governments have done. Yeah, well, you're a venture capitalist in, uh, in Tokyo um, and, yeah. and Su Sunbridge is your company. And right. I wonder how uh, COVID, as it, as it has unfolded in Japan yeah. and is unfolding, uh, has affected your company and for that matter, venture capitalism and, yeah. and entrepreneurship yeah. in Japan. Can you talk about that? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a great question. Well, early, early on, uh, you know, my managers were concerned about, uh, and, and I think we, we tended as a company, even though I, I communicated to my employees to not worry, make sure if during lockdown they got out, got exercise, got some fresh air. Uh, certainly if everyone else is staying at home, one of the safest is you could be is out in the park. Um, but I was encouraging the employees not to worry about it too much, but we did go, we did opt for a work from home regime for about a month and a half. And what we were finding is that business was progressing to some degree. There were, there were increased efficiencies, uh, operating over zoom via home. For example, today I, I did not, we did not have to schedule this call for when a time when I happened to be in Honolulu. And I know you, you've had the technology to do this for a long time and you and Steve have been doing it forever. But what, what I discovered in the company is that the sales team who had always assumed they needed to meet face-to-face -face with customers were able to move sales projects forward, close business, uh, even though there were some unexpected delays in certain aspects of it, business continued as usual in, in the two software companies that I run. Uh, and we engaged from the beginning in terms of what are we learning about operating over Zoom, about working from home versus in the office? What are the pros and cons of each approach? When, wh whether or not we come, we come out of this back to the old normal or if we really are living in a new world, at the very least, we should be thinking about the optimum mix of technology-based interactions internally and with customers and face-to-face -face interactions. What things are better face-to-face, -face, what things are more, are equally eff effective and more efficient online. So there's, there's been a lot of that kind of conversation. And for me, for me personally, there was a, a tremendous silver lining in this. My father is at the late stages of his life and he's dealing with brain cancer right now. And when the, the company went into work from home mode, it occurred to me that I could work with my employees from Utah in the United States just as easily as I could work from my apartment in Tokyo. So I had, I had the chance to spend six months with my dad in the earlier stages of his disease while he could still get up and go on a morning walk and get around the house on his own and, and got to spend six weeks of really great quality time with my parents uh, as, a blessing, as a blessing in disguise from uh, you know, what we're going through right now. So, uh, uh, and forcing my, my siblings and I, we, we all had a family conversation about what if one of us happens to get Corona and that accelerates his demise, how would we feel about that? How would, do we want him to be in a facility where there's, you know, 24 hour medical care for him? And our decision as a family was we'd much rather spend time together as a family, interacting, interacting as a family if, if nothing is going on outside. And if, if as a consequence of that, uh, Corona happened to accelerate his his demise. That we were okay with that. We would rather be together as a family than have an uncertain period of time when we felt like we had to stay apart, couldn't hug, couldn't interact, couldn't talk. Yeah. Couldn't be in the same room. That's so, a very so we, important we often, conversation. I, I'm really I'm really lucky that I have six siblings who all you know and and parents who were all very comfortable that 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 was the choice we wanted to make. It's good that you had the conversation. I I think that's what people have to have that conversation now. They have to figure out what the contingent uh, plan is. Yeah. So Steve, uh, let's talk to you about education. Um, you mentioned before the show began that you're you're now actively or about to actively teach classes at the Scheidler Business School. This is great. And you're doing it all virtually. Um, tell me how that works and um, 
Uh, you know, Alan suggested it's more efficient that way, and I agree. Uh, is it more efficient um, for you? Yeah. Uh, before I get to that, just to illustrate uh, Alan's earlier point about the efficiencies of using Zoom, my wife uh, is a, a high level manager for a major pharmaceutical company. And of course, when mm -hmm. the lockdown occurred in Japan, the pharmaceutical reps could not visit the doctor's office. And, and this is sac sacrosanct, it's like religious. You have to go every week, even if they, you don't meet the doctor. And what she discovered that after the lockdown was in place, the sales in, held steady. So yeah. by not having the sales reps visit, yeah. the sales didn't go down. That's kind of what they expected. And in some cases, the sales actually went up without the visits by the sales reps. So a lot of interesting discoveries are being made by companies now yeah. looking at the way business patterns, customs have developed over decades and how in this period of time when all of that was forced to stop, new efficiencies are being discovered. Now, regarding education, uh, all I have to say is that uh, it's a mess. It's just a mess <laughs> at a micro level. And you, you, Trump has announced now that schools have to conduct face-to-face -face education, which affects us because uh, we have exchange students. So if the school is only teaching online for safety reasons, they decide to do mm -hmm. that, then technically mm -hmm. the students have to return back to Japan. Um, it's, mm -hmm. it's really... I've been in education for 10 years, and this is definitely the worst period that I, I've ever experienced, including uh, 311 when we had the nuclear breakdown uh, here in Japan. That was horrible, of course, but nothing like this. Then to answer your question on a personal level, yes, I'm teaching two courses now, one at Scheidler and one at West Oahu. I have 34 students in total between the two classes. And this is the first time I'm ever gonna be teaching where I'm not gonna meet my students. I am doing Zoom sessions for the Manoa students. I'm doing a hybrid model. Which is, I'm sure you've seen that term in the paper quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So mostly asynchronous, they do their work on their own. Four classes I'm doing um, live. I'm actually trying to get Alan to be a guest lecturer for one of my courses. Mm -hmm. I want the students to meet real entrepreneurs, even if they can't do it in person. Very good. And then the, uh, the uh, West Oahu course, uh, by mandate, is all asynchronous. So I have no interaction with them whatsoever. They prefer asynchronous. Hmm. So it's been about a week or so now. So far, so good. Um, there are some efficiencies, of course, in that I don't have to go to the classroom and neither do the students. But the preparation work, strictly looking at it as a teacher, and the management of the class is much more intense online than it is in person. You know, I have to, I'm printing so much more. I have to be way more organized than I normally am. It's, uh, it's more difficult, at least for me to transition from face-to-face -to, -face to online. Maybe after a couple of years of doing this, I'll say online is easier or to manage, but right now it's harder for me. Is, is the educational product as good for the students or better? You know, uh, <clears throat> we've done lots of surveys and of course um, the Chronicle of Higher Education, which I religiously follow, uh, has surveyed their institutions as well. I say in general, students feel that the quality of the course online is lower than face to face, it, it's pretty, pretty consistent feedback. They do see some efficiencies and some benefits, like they can study when they want and so forth. But I don't think you would have anybody really make a serious case that online education is as good as face to face. Yeah. I think it's very troublesome that uh, Trump said he was going to withdraw federal funding from institutions of higher education in this country if they didn't abide by his requirement of uh, reopening the schools for face to face. Um, I don't know, that really creates a, a conundrum for that. Whatever, whatever any local government or independent body decides that he doesn't like. Uh, unfortunately, we've built a society where so many local operations are dependent on federal subsidies. Uh, Isn't that true? So there's that, there's that, but that's certainly, that's just par for the course for Trump. Yeah, well, it's, uh, we're seeing that now. It's like as, as the swamp is being drained, so to speak, uh, I'm not mm -hmm. talking about his swamp, I'm talking about our swamp. Uh, as the swamp is being drained, we, we see all these flaws. And one of the flaws we've seen is that everybody is dependent on federal funding. Yeah. So, so the chief executive can really turn you around any day of the week on so many points right. where they threaten to withdraw federal funding. And I didn't know that, that the president could do that. I thought Congress was the one who did that, but apparently he can make that threat and it sticks. Yeah. Uh, and so there'll be some schools in, in the US uh, that suffer over this. I mean, if you go yeah. through with the threat, uh, yeah. I mean, who knows what that'll, you know, that 
higher education is at such great duress anyway, because mm -hmm. think about the immigration side of it, right? You got all these these uh, students who now they're either they're either left in Asia or they have to go to Asia, and that means the cash flow to these universities is seriously curtailed, and they're in trouble anyway. They they can't they can't really make a living. Um, so on top of that, you have this requirement or this um, withdrawal of federal funding. Gee whiz, the pressure is is extraordinary. Uh, so, Steve, if you want to come back and be part of an American school, hmm. think twice. Uh, yeah, I've, I've got my headaches here. Yeah, I'm, I, 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 what I, the, the little bit that I'm seeing and hearing about edu how the education is reacting in the United States or being told to react versus how it is in Japan, my sense is that within Japan, uh, giving children and young adults the education that is provided for them in the society is being prioritized over preventing them from getting sick uh, on, on the grand schemes of things. There, there, there was a month or so shutdown of elementary schools. There's a lot of discuss about how to incorporate online training and, and adjust classroom layouts and things. But my, my sense is that the Japanese education system, whether it's from uh, preschools through universities, is not going into all online shutdown. The the, the kind of that the, the overall um, the policy around education is being pursued in a more balanced and prioritizing the the right of kids to get a good education so, uh, at at essentially the same level as protecting the society's health. That they're, that they're evaluating trade offs and. Well, let me let me throw more, this one at you. Balanced. We first started talking about reopening, and Trump started it. Mm -hmm. um, this is what is this March, maybe March or April. Yep. Yep. Um, you know, it struck me, and I, I, I would guess it struck you guys too, that wait a minute, let's let's not go to reopening until we have a plan on containing the virus, because then reopening is much more comfortable, predictable, less risky. Um, mm -hmm. We never had that. We don't have that now. Yeah. Uh, but for example, testing. You know, um, we need to have tests available. Mm -hmm. Two is we have to have, um, you know, tests that lead to tracing and we have to have tracing that works uh, at, at uh, two o'clock Kauai time. That's right after this show is mm -hmm. over. Mm -hmm. We're having our chief scientist come on. His mm -hmm. name is Mike DeWert and he's really mm -hmm. a tremendous guy. Mm -hmm. And he's made an analysis of how you would make a plan using testing and mm -hmm. then tracing. Uh, mm -hmm. to determine exactly where the virus was going. That means getting data. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you'll appreciate data is so central in all of that. Um, getting data from everybody who is tested mm -hmm. uh, and then tracking the data to make sure that, you know, that what happened before the test, you know, can be traced. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's the kind of plan that we have needed. It may be out of the box by now, but um, maybe it's not too late to implement a plan like that. Mm -hmm. where you could have all the education you want, you could have face-to-face, -face, but you just have to implement certain control steps, and then you can have both. The, you know, of course, the desired result is to have both, right? Uh, have, have you had a PCR test yet, Jay? No, I, 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 I think I think there's a very serious flaw with that approach to the problem, and, and mm -hmm. here's what it is. The equipment to do the RNA analysis is quite is fairly expensive. And I did, I did one test in California. My wife, when I came from Utah to California, my wife was very concerned about, you know, maybe I picked up the disease in Japan, maybe in Utah, I don't have symptoms. I felt just fine the whole time, but maybe I have it and maybe I would spread it. And uh, uh, looking at the WHO documents by the research that we did early on and the CDC, uh, the, if you read the documents as opposed to listening to the pronouncements of Jay Fauci or the head of WHO on television, what you see is essentially zero, very so close to zero that it's not worth thinking about probability of asymptomatic spread. Uh, two or three cases identified by late March of pre one day before showing symptoms, the, the, the virus was spread. That has to incubate enough that it actually is enough volume in the uh, the what you expel from your body in a cough uh, or speaking in a loud voice that it, it's the the a and there's been a little bit of television coverage during the Black Lives Matters uh, riots 
pointing out that, that the asymptomatic spread is not as serious a risk as we thought at the beginning, but WHO has been saying from the beginning that it's not a serious threat. So the, the, prob the problem with the testing is that the equipment's very expensive. In Japan, it took take three days because they have to get sent to a lab. When I returned to Japan for my visit to the States, it took three days before I knew whether I had the virus or not. And if you buy into, if you don't buy into the asymptomatic spread, a very effective tool, which I'm seeing in lots of restaurants in Japan now, is a temperature check before you enter the restaurant. Are you running a temperature? If you are, that's a, that's a, you know, it's a sign of any number of possible diseases. And that would be, in my mind, a very fair and reasonable reason to not be sat sat in a restaurant or not to be able to attend school that day. If you're running a fever, you're you're certainly sick with something, and it could be corona. So the, the fact that the fact that no one is talking about dispersing forehead temperature checkers or using them at airports or using them in schools, we've had conversations about gun control security booths in schools. Those are pretty expensive solution to avoid a, a different uh, social problem in America. But I've not heard a conversation anywhere in the media about supplying all the schools with a forehead temperature checker and just taking the temperature students where they enter the classroom and say, are you running a fever? If not, if so, please go home today. If not, the, the risk that you have the disease and are going to spread it to someone during the class, the one hour class of Sunday, is low enough that we're okay with that. So that, another difference is I'm seeing, I'm seeing those temperature checkers all over in Japan. Like we, have, we have one in both of the offices now. It's optional for the employees to use it to, to self-test, but most restaurants now are requiring patrons to have a temperature check before they sit it's down. easy enough. You know, I went on Amazon and priced one. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see what it cost to get one. I mean, a commercial one, one you could use it in a restaurant. Yep. 60 bucks, 60 bucks, Alan. Yeah, 60. but that's a, lot, that's a lot less than several tens of thousands of dollars for medical equipment to do RNA testing. So That's so uh, cheap. That's so uh, cheap for the protection it offers. Yeah. yeah. It, it, to to get to have one for every teacher to test to check the temperature of every child that comes into a classroom, or uh, one one in each restaurant. <laughs> uh, Michiko, we're on on air. Michiko, <laughs> Michiko we're on air. So, so, <laughs> there's a mysterious moving chair behind me. That's my wife. Why, why, why yeah, we're having this new experience us? here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Steve, Don't what is head. happening at, at Kansai Gadai? Are you testing yeah, the temperature? So yeah, let me uh, illustrate Alan's point a bit more. I, I, I belong to a gym, which was you know, locked down for two and a half months. I think I gained a, a couple kilos as a result yeah. of that. And they've opened now, yeah. uh, very limited activities, any kind of uh, strong physical exertion is banned. My favorite classes are all banned now. So they have yeah. yoga and aromatherapy, you know, things I'm not so interested in. But anyway, when I go in, they take my temperature, it's automatic. And if I'm above a certain level, I don't know what it is, uh, then I can't go in. So that is being deployed in retail outlets uh, in Japan. And uh, I, I don't know, seems, seems to be working. We, Japan's going through a somewhat of a bump here. I mean, by, by relative standards, it's nothing compared to what's going on in like Florida and so forth. But uh, those precautions are in place in gyms and other places where theoretically the risk is higher. Regarding Gaidai, uh, we did decide as a institution for this spring semester, it was delayed by about five or six weeks because of the lockdown and then went 100% online. So the, the campus over here, completely empty. All students are engaging with their professors through Zoom right now. But in the fall, which will start in early September, we're moving to 100% face-to-face. And uh, they haven't announced the protocols yet for that, but I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if they take the temperature of all 12,000 students when they come to the campus as a way of trying to protect the school and the students from further infection. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're looking at right now. So, but nothing about uh, distancing and every other seat and have to wear uh, you a know, mask to class and all? It's that, they talk about that and they're gonna give guidance on that, but that is impossible to do. The people, the students take the buses to get to the campus, they get on the, I, I rode on the train for the first time in three months uh, yesterday. The trains are packed here. You cannot social distance on certain train lines. Mm -hmm. It's impossible. So they will talk about that, but that will not be something that they can accomplish. And, and I don't know if they'll be able to, have the two meter or one meter distance uh, with the students in the classrooms because we may not have enough classrooms if students are spread out that way. 
Uh, they're well, they're in, thinking about all of that. In the in the U.S., uh, more and more the news includes uh, news stories about how people don't want to wear masks. Uh, given retail, uh, we'll say you can't come in without a mask, and they'll get into yeah. a physical argument over it, violence. Uh, there are a lot of people that firmly believe that they that their liberty under the Constitution includes the right to say no to a mask, uh, even though you know, as the Japanese fully know that it's more for the, it's more for the community than it is for the individual. Yeah. So, so one yeah, so thing. Yeah. So yesterday. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, yesterday on the train, even though it was crowded. 100%. There was not a single person on the train that wasn't wearing a mask. It's remarkable how Japanese people Japanese have uh, endorsed that. As Alan mentioned, it's part of our culture anyway for yeah. influenza and also for allergies. So mm -hmm. during certain times of the year, 40% of the people would be wearing masks. Now, 100%. It's incredible. So it, it's so unpleasant. It's even, unpleasant even to be seen. Country, we, we can't get uh, the good masks, the, uh, what is it, N95 masks. Mm -hmm. uh, in this country, uh, there's a lot of people that sort of impersonate masks. They mm -hmm. make masks out of T-shirts that are obviously mm -hmm. not effective. Mm -hmm. um, in this country, um, you know, the supply lines for this sort of thing are jeopardized. Right now, there's a big thing about the testing equipment. Uh, the, the certain element is involved in testing, and, and it's made in China, and it stopped. Uh, La Roche, Roche is a pharmaceutical mm -hmm. that was, uh, anyway, it stopped. Yeah. And uh, now, now you can't have so much testing anymore. Um, so, you know, I'm asking you this, Alan, because it, to me, it's a venture capital issue. Uh, we we uh, interviewed a guy in the University of Michigan who was working on a speed test where you'd know if you had COVID in like five minutes. Yeah. But but he can't get money. Yeah. Um, a friend of mine is associated with a with a company in Singapore. Um, that uh, what do they have? It's uh, likewise, it's a test. Testing, very important. Um, and it's part of that test trace combination. Yeah. Um, but they, they haven't gotten FDA approval. And this guy, by the way, in Michigan, he hasn't gotten FDA approval either. So uh, in, in each case, they believe they have a, a worthy test, but in mm -hmm. neither case has the FDA approved it. Right. That could be corruption. I don't know if it is or not. You know, it wouldn't surprise me. But as a venture capitalist, um, don't you think this is a, an ideal situation for the establishment of startups who have valid, uh, who have valid technology, who can offer something to the marketplace. Yeah, <laughs> of course it is. If if the tests being developed are a little more general purpose than the current iteration of the SARS virus, which is SARS two COVID nineteen. <clears throat> if it if and if in if for example, if that test could also detect. The different varieties of influenza could detect rhinovirus versus so if if it was a test that could identify what virus is causing you to be sick that would be a very useful general purpose tool um and i i think there there is a, a habit within the startup community and the venture company which i would call flavor of the day and so it would not surprise me if this person gets funding for his idea from somebody uh, because Corona is so top of mind right now. And, and I think the likelihood that a legitimate useful test would be accelerated through the FDA process is higher now than at any other time. And usually, usually something, something in the medical field, there's a very long drawn out process uh, and it takes a very special kind of venture capitalist to get excited about investing in those deals where you're dealing with a 10 year lifetime on a fund. But it would, it would seem to me that if, if out of these solutions have a little more general application than, than the specific current uh, genome of this, the current SARS virus, mm -hmm. then uh, yeah, certainly, it certainly seems like it would be a good time to back something like that because it's likely to get FDA fast-tracked if, it, if it's a legitimate solution. Even for COVID, the, the, being able to help with COVID would get fast-tracked and if it's then also useful for other detecting and identifying other diseases, that would be a very powerful uh, thing. I, think. You know, I saw an article yesterday about um, a guy who, I guess he's uh, acquainted with Trump and he's not in the biomedical space at all. Mm -hmm. He was in some kind of information technology space, but he had the bright idea of, a, of a, a, an injection device mm. it's made out of plastic and it's a throwaway. Mm -hmm. 
So mm -hmm. as and when there is a vaccine, this injection device, which has yeah. a plastic bulb filled with the vaccine, you mm -hmm. inject somebody, you push the bulb, then you throw away the, uh, mm -hmm. the device. And uh, uh, Trump has, is causing the federal government to back this guy's company, even though mm. they, they've made a, a few hundred, um, what do you call it, pilot, pilot yeah. devices they have yeah. not manufactured, nor do they have a manufacturing facility. Mm. And it strikes me that there's going to be a huge opportunity when you start doing the math on the number of people who have to be injected. Story is uh, the injection would be two injections. And it would be around the world and would probably have to be repeated like like flu uh, vaccination yeah. Um, yeah. In, you know, in months yeah. or years. And so the, the amount of money to be made yeah. is extraordinary. And um, I think that's yeah. that's going to be something else that comes down the pike as and when we, yeah. he's this guy is smart because he's assuming there'll be a vaccine, that which is right. not a certainty. Um, yeah. And if he can get into a business where you 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 know you're able to manufacture what? Uh, eight or nine billion units or yeah. more. Uh, yeah. You can make a buck that way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, and I wonder though, in Japan, my recollection about Japan is Japan is um, it's not anti-vax, but it's also like it's not comfortable with invasive procedures. Are people going to take a vaccine? Are they going to take an injection, or will there be resistance? I, I think there will be resistance everywhere. I I think. Uh, the the traceability uh the you know proliferation of the, the, so so there, there are all kinds of things man where i i suspect uh it will be mandated and what we will be restricted from doing or find in too inconvenient to do if we're not vaccinated will be so such a nuisance that only a handful of very very uh avid hardcore you're not putting anything in my body sir uh, people will will fight it, um, and and in general, in general, I think the Japanese kind of tend to like to go along with the herd. Uh, in general, they trust their government more than we trust ours, um, and so I, I think it's highly likely that there there will be there will be people who, despite all the inconveniences that are imposed on those that don't vaccinate, will choose not to vaccinate. Yeah. Um, but well, I think, one, I think there's, there's an over there's there's, a, there's certainly a storyline. There is money to be made, uh, and I, I think I think we'll be facing all kinds of restrictions on our activities uh, if we don't vaccinate. Mm. It's, just, it's, just, it's, just, it's the way the storyline and agenda seems to be playing out. Yeah, another element to this is societal pressure beyond what the government says. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you go out and you're not wearing a mask, like if I go onto the campus right now and I'm not wearing a mask. People will tell me to wear a mask. So once a vaccine is developed or some kind of injection to reduce the incidence of, of the virus, uh, the pressure from your peers will be so strong in this country to adhere yeah. to that, that uh, that will drive people's behavior as well. So beyond what the government yeah. says. Yeah, that's true. All things being equal, um, you know, I think that Japan will be way ahead of uh, you know the state of mind in the U.S., there are a lot of anti-vaxxers in the U.S., and they believe yeah. that the you know the Constitution gives them the freedom to say no, and they will say no, uh, yeah. even though it, it you know it injures the, all the community around them. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. very troublesome. The other thing about Japan is you know recently the World Health Organization announced that um, you know the coronavirus can be uh, it can it can be uh, spread. Um, by aerosol, by aerosol, right? And they announced that, and that seems to be the, the current thinking. But I'll tell you the truth. I remember uh, a piece I saw on television, probably in March, about Japanese researchers who were using infrared cameras mm -hmm. uh, to check out this, the spread of, um, you know, vaporized particles, uh, aerosol particles yeah. in a room where somebody had coughed, uh, you know, an hour before or two or five hours, and they were still in the air. If you looked uh, at the uh, aerosol, uh, the, the infrared, <clears throat> and, I'm, and I'm thinking the Japanese knew this months before the World Health Organization knew this. Uh, so I think that at some level, uh, Japanese medical and science are, are really ahead. And, and I, I would put my money on a Japanese pharmaceutical company coming up with something. I, don't, I haven't heard that they have, mm. but I wonder if you guys know whether they're working on it and whether Japan 
uh, is determined to come up with a, vi a, a vaccine. Okay. One one thing I one thing uh, there's a category of product in Japan that you hear about all the time. It's been around for a while, but it's being promoted and purchased a lot more now than in the past. I have never run across a product like this in the United States, and it's air conditioners that uh, filter the air, take out, and and it's specific. It's designed, I think, originally around the annual spring um, hay fever issue that Jap Japan deals with to basically remove uh, um, problematic particles from the air in homes. And so there's been a wave of purchases of air cleansing air conditioners uh, in Japan. Um, uh, I have one, Alan. Yeah, and there's, there's, quite, a, there's, quite, there's quite a bit. One, one of the things I, I really admire about Japanese television, whether it's the public channel NHK or the private channels, they do really good educational uh, video. That that it it does it doesn't tend to have a strong angle other than sharing information from experts on how to live a healthier life. So there are all kinds of programs, whether it's humorous variety shows that have bits about uh, healthy eating, or you know, I, I've seen a couple of programs that showed how breath particles spread when you're running, walking, singing. Uh, how w at what rate do the heavier products drop to the ground with kind of computer simulations of Maybe how far is it better to jog beside a person or behind her? But and the, the outcome was you're better jogging side to side mm. and separated through, separated a meter or two front to back. You should separate further uh, if you're going forward, but side to side is okay based on how the particles spread and drop. So I've uh, both this kind of product that's sort of a, a health conscious. Uh, variation on a traditional consumer product, and and the kind of programming that's presented on television. That you know there there is the the sort of the scary news bit of it, but there's there's a lot of really good uh, balanced uh, editorial material and educational material on all all the channels in Japan. And I I really respect the media here for that. Yeah, and there's so many other things. I know they you know I know they're going to come up with some kind of home version of uh, the ultraviolet light, which, mm -hmm. uh, which has been you know, a big point of discussion around here. But Steve, we're out of time, and I wanted to ask you if you could speculate as to what we could talk about next time. Where, where do you think the trail will take us in two weeks? Oh, um, for Japan specifically, you're talking about? Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned that there's been a slight uptick, in, in, especially in Tokyo, in, in terms of the numbers. And again, the numbers relative to the United States are insignificant. Um, you know, the infection rates in some states are the, what Japan's experienced uh, throughout the whole period of uh, Corona. Um, but I imagine things are pretty much going to proceed in, in the ways that, that it has been over the, la the last couple of weeks or so. Uh, for the most part, businesses will remain open and engaged. Uh, schools will remain open and engaged. Um, the economy in Japan uh, is still suffering. Uh, because of the lockdown, that it's very clear. Uh, but it, at least at the, we haven't got the official numbers yet since things have reopened. But the sense that I have, just being out and about, uh, the traffic patterns and the the vibe of the of of the community, is that things are back. Maybe not at 100 percent, but probably 80 to 90 percent of what we were at prior to when this uh, occurred. So I suspect that more or less we'll continue along that same path. Alan, do you, do you agree with that, or do you see any? My, my impression is the same. That that uh, you know, when we when we have our all hands meetings, the the chairs are being separated. You've picked up enough on my attitude on this that I think it's silly. But the the employees are more comfortable when we do that, and and the employees are being allowed to participate in the all hands meeting from their desk via Zoom, or to come into the room with the with the other employees that that are in the the separated chairs rooms. And my sense is that overall, the Japanese feel that if they're wearing their masks, washing their hands, uh, avoiding aggressively foolish behavior, uh, that that we'll be okay. We'll get through this okay. And and that uh, it's not life as usual uh, in any stretch of the imagination. But I think the Japanese are comfortable that just following the basic uh, guidelines of of not spending too much time too close to a, a large people, avoiding large crowds, although the, the trains are an exception. But I think even, even riding the trains, the Japanese are making the decision that if I'm wearing the mask, other people are wearing a mask, 
and I'm conscious if uh, if I am feeling ill or and stay out of those places if I'm feeling ill, if I don't host large parties in restaurants, that will be okay. Uh, the, yeah. the overall, you know, there there will be cases and there will people get sick and there there will continue to occasionally be someone who dies from it. But I my sense is that the masks are making the Japanese feel safe enough. The masks, the masks and measures and just being reasonably wise are, are enough for them to feel like we should we should be you know getting on with things as society uh, yeah. in that context. Yeah, doing the right thing, doing the right thing. Yeah. Well, thank you, Alan. Alan Miner and Steve Zercher, thank you so much, you guys. It's, it's great having you on the show, uh, Alan. And Steve, I look forward to seeing you in, in uh, two weeks. And Alan, I hope you come back to us soon so we can, we can well, follow, follow as the as breadcrumbs as on as Hawaii, this. As soon as Hawaii will let me come in and Japan will let me come back, <laughs> as, soon as, as soon as visiting with you on your program is considered urgent and necessary, <laughs> I'll, 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 be, I'll be there in a flash. Okay. Thank you, Alan. All Thank right. you, Steve. Aloha, you guys. Stay safe.